co-host who's transformed into a guest on the show because uh, Gary Hawkins here uh, is going to be talking about his latest uh, white paper that he put out uh, called Retail 4.0. Hi, Gary. Shaker, great to be with you. Yeah, and so our co-host transformed to guest today is going to be answering some questions that uh, uh, we have about this fascinating white paper and, you know, appreciate all the participation, all the people who've been out there listening uh, week after week of this podcast. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you guys uh, participating and we'd love to hear back from you. Uh, but let's get started here, Gary. I'm really excited about this. This is, this is a long time in the making. I know you, about 10 years ago, I remember reading uh, Retail 3.0 and that's one of the papers that really got me excited. In fact, you know, really validated what we were trying to do at Bird's Eye. Okay. And, uh, and so Retail 4.0 is around, what, what, what was the inspiration? Is it a 10 year thing or is it 2020, well, what's, what's the thing? It, it was really a combination. I, I got, you know, focused on all the change and all the increasing amount of change that's going on in the growth of digital and, and so on. And, you know, I got thinking, I, I like to try to look at that change in sort of perspective of where the industry has been historically. So, you know, go back to retail 3.0 um, and, and sort of the, the history there. Uh, if you think, go back to the early 1940s was really the dawn of retail 1.0, the age of national brands, right? It was the first media networks, the first self-service stores that gave birth to national brands. And for 50, 60 years, those national brands, you know, controlled the supply chain. They were the industry. Mm -hmm. And then in the mid nineties, Walmart entered the grocery business, triggering a, a wave of consolidation. That's when Safeway began to grow so big, Kroger and a couple others. And we shifted to sort of the age of big retail, right? So bigger retails, retailers leveraging their power in the supply chain for better purchasing deals, growth of private label, that type thing. And then, you know, along in the, um, uh, around 2000 or so, it, it struck me that we were entering a new age and that was really retail uh, 3.0. And, you know, 3.0 was all about the coming uh, wave of personalization in digital and collaboration between brands and retailers leveraging all this customer data. And, and this, it was really a little past 2000, probably closer to 2010. And, and so I got looking at everything going on in the industry today. And more importantly, what I think is coming over the next few years, and it really caused me to sit back and think that, you know, I, I think 3.0 is over. I think we're entering a new age now, retail 4.0, that I call the age of metamorphosis. And uh, I'm expecting all this to, to happen over the next five years. Wow. So are we saying retail 5.0 is going to come in five years? From now? <laughs> <laughs> it's getting faster. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Terrific. I mean, you put out some really great concepts here. And I think right in the beginning of your paper, you're trying to define some terms here. And maybe we want to help our audience understand some of these terms here. And I'm going to just uh, pull the paper up. And, and I think that kind of, it's used, you defined it as a new lexicon for the digital world, yeah. right? Yep. And, you know, we've all heard of digitization, but you speak of something called digitalization. Right, right. So what's the, so, what's the so, what do you so, see this difference? So I, I think the way to think of it is digitization is the easy example is think of photography. Right, what used to be a a, a print, um, you know, has become digital. Or think of, uh, you know, today many invoices now instead of being paper are communicated electronically or digitally. So that's digitization of, of content, if you will. Digitalization takes a, takes it a step further and leverages that digital content now into changing that business process right, and, and transforming the business process. So that's more digitalization. Got it. So, so one is just transforming the nature of the content, the other is transforming the nature of the transforming process. The, the process, the itself. process is involved, right. Got it, got it, cool, cool. Okay, so, so Gary, you also talk about this other term, which people are probably familiar with, it's automation, but how does it apply specifically to retail? So, so I, I think most people in the retail industry and, and in general, most people today, when they think of automation, they think of robotics, right? And in retail, they're thinking of, you know, the robots going down the aisle or maybe the robotic floor cleaning machines 
or robotics that's used in distribution centers and that type of thing. And that's all very accurate. That's automation. What I've really focused on in the 4.0 paper was the automation of business processes through software. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you know, business process automation. And I think this is, I don't think this is on most people's radar screens yet, but this is absolutely transformative technology. Uh, again, like many other areas, largely powered by AI and machine learning right now. But I think this is going to be just massively transforming to the industry. And again, this is all going to happen over the next very few years. So you're really talking about, you know, technologies like, uh, you know, AI, big data, really converting yeah. like marketing automation, being able yeah. to automatically trigger, you know, communications and, uh, you know, promotions and designing campaigns yeah, yeah, yes. without human interference. Th right. That's right. I, I mean, think about, uh, you know, two examples in marketing, right? Think about the retailers that today, you know, some number of category managers, merchandisers uh, coming together to put together the weekly ad right? Making decisions. We have these things on deal. Uh, this is what we did last year um, and pulling those things together for the weekly ad, deciding on prices and, and so on. Think of automating all that through software because all that data is out there and it's available, right? All those deals are available electronically, digitally from the vendors, from the manufacturers. So the content, digital content, if you will, is all there to do that. Another, what I think to me is even better example is, you know, think about this in, in the, the world of bird's eye and personalization. You know, think about the process retailers have gone through to date um, to take advantage of personalization, right? They, they have to first understand an audience or a customer segment. They then bring together and create some type of offer pool. And then those offers are run through the personalization engine to come up with X number for each shopper. Think of all that being automated right? The, the software itself suggesting an audience that needs to be focused on either to better retain them, to grow their value, to um, uh, you know, protect them from defecting somewhere uh, and so on. And then the system itself suggesting here are the products to promote and here are the prices to promote them at to each customer, mm. right? And all this optimized against a budget or against, you know, whatever the best performance uh, benchmark is, but again, automating this whole process. Wow. Wow. Does, does that, you know, people listening to this going to be scared for their jobs? Oh, I, th there are massive ramifications here to um, uh, people, right? Uh, you know, we're already seeing this in the store with the uh, adoption of Amazon Go like technology, you know, all the computer vision stuff, eliminating the jobs of cashiers what we're talking about with business process automation is automating more, you know, white collar type jobs, right? Uh, office jobs. Um, you know, we're already seeing a lot of this happening in the world of HR, uh, actually onboarding, uh, you know, making sure all the paperwork is filled out for new hires, training, more and more of that entire HR onboarding process is becoming automated. So the same thing could be applied to merchandising, many other areas. But, but I guess in some cases, you can also think about it being able to bring in more efficiency so people are able to focus on more important things. So, and, uh, you know, uh, instead of sitting and trying to figure out what offers to put out, you're now focusing on something more strategic, which is more customer facing, maybe, right? So, so I, I agree. I mean, in an ideal world, you would like to think that the people that are maybe displaced by automation are provided other roles in the organization where they can add value where machines can't yet. Right. But I, right. I think the other important thing for uh, uh, listeners to really focus on relative to automation is it's not just about cost efficiencies. It's not just about getting rid of, you know, payroll. It's when you automate something through software and you do it properly, it's not only automating it and eliminating human labor, you've now put in place a process that is going to get faster and it's going to get better with every single decision cycle. And that's the power of AI and machine learning right. as you well know. Right, right. Right, so it's not just replacing people, it's making better decisions faster. Right. 
All right, so let's go down this paper here. You've got a number of topics. I doubt we'll be able to cover every one of them, but you know, I'm gonna pick a few ones that I think are stand out here. So you talk about uh, page 10, digital doppelgangers, right? That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's really interesting. You know, I read through the paper, first time I read this, when it was still a draft copy, I thought that was an amazing term because it so beautifully describes exactly what I think machine learning is trying to do. So. For the audience, can you tell us a little bit more? What do you mean by digital doppelgangers? Yeah, so, so what is happening is, and, and I use two examples in the paper. The first is, you know, some of these robots cruising up and down the aisle looking for out of stocks and so on are actually creating a digital duplicate of that physical store, right? So when the time comes when augmented reality and visual, uh, virtual reality hit prime time, and that's also coming pretty fast, uh, stores working with this company will have a digital duplicate of that store already created, right? That they can plug into an AR system or into a VR system. Um, but there's also this idea of creating digital duplicates of customers, of effectively creating in the digital world a replica of that shopper based upon all the data, all the knowledge we have of that person when they shop, what they buy, what they don't buy, what aisles they go down, all this massive big data and information. And when a digital duplicate or a digital doppelganger is created of that customer, it can then serve to test and, and uh, uh, apply to different models of behavior to better understand how is this customer gonna to react to this promotion? How are they gonna to react to that marketing? Uh, scheme, those types of things. It's, it's creating a duplicate um, uh, customer in the digital world that can be used to, to test and simulate new things. Right, right. It's almost like the matrix, I guess. Yeah. You know, you have, the, you have the customer living in the matrix. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's not as scary as that. You know, it's actually pretty friendly because all we're really trying to do here is to improve uh, customer experience, improving, you know, value back to the customer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it makes perfect sense. And that, you know, I, I, who do you think is, you know, obviously, you know, at Bird's Eye, we're working on a number of these things, but who do you look at as an example of somebody who's doing this really well? So the, the automation and the, uh, yeah. the this digital moving in this direction, uh, I, I'll tell you, I, I, I would have to point, I think Kroger is certainly going down this path. Um, but, you know, of the retailers I have knowledge of today, you know, the guest we had on last week, Ron Bonacci from Weiss Markets, uh, mm -hmm. they're doing some really interesting things. They've already started down this path of automation. They've started down this path of using effectively these digital duplicates to, to create these models. Nice, nice, fantastic. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's a really, it can be a scary time. But to me, it's, it also can be a really exciting time. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, wow, you know, I'm looking at this list here and there's just so many exciting things to talk about. So uh, you, you talk here on the, in this one chapter, page 14, where did all the people go, right? And uh, what, what, do you, what do you mean by, what do you mean exactly? So, by so, where so what I'm calling out there is again, as we were just talking about, the impact of this business process automation over time. And, you know, think about going into the office building of a, you know, larger regional or even national retailer. And, you know, where all the dozens of marketing people were, there's a bunch of empty space because a lot of that work has now been automated mm. and is being done in the digital realm. Right. You go over to the merchandising area where there were dozens, maybe hundreds of people in the past making decisions around what new products to carry, what price to put on them, how much inventory to carry, where does it get slotted on the shelf, all that becoming automated. You know, mm -hmm. where do all those people go and, you know, carry that through almost every department around the organization. Uh, so that's what I refer to about, you know, where do all the people go? And, you know, I want to call out. I do not have, I don't know if anyone has the, the answers or can, has the crystal ball to be able to definitively say, well, this is where all the people are going to go. You know, they're gonna be displaced by automation here, but they're gonna have productive roles over here. 
I don't know. I think this is something society has to grapple with. Right. But the call out I really wanted to make in that section of the paper was the risk to traditional retailers that is posed by potentially a new uh, entrant coming into the market without the legacy of thousands, tens of thousands of employees, without the legacy of systems and processes and practices, and creating a new form of retail built on a digital core. Let I was talking like, uh, like a retail startup, like a store that's, that's operating more like a startup yes. built on you know, lean startup methodologies. Ab absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you know, one could say, well, gee, that's Amazon. And yeah, maybe. Um, but uh, in Amazon, obviously, is doing a lot of things. But I, I think there, there is a risk to traditional retailers today from somebody coming in from outside the industry without all these legacy systems and, and resources and so on, starting with a clean sheet of paper, leveraging all these new technologies, digital technologies, and creating a form of retail that has a vastly different cost model and, and revenue model. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. That's exciting and scary if yeah, you're a that, retailer, that, that, right? Yeah, that, that can yeah. be scary. Exactly. All right. So, uh, I mean, so retail 4.0, you're talking about, you know, not just uh, transforming the store as we know it and retail operations, but you're also talking about a, a business model for FMCG retail. So this is uh, something that's going to impact brands as well, I'm assuming. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yes. So w w what are we talking about? What's this new business model we're talking about? Well, so I, I think one, I, I think we're going to see a, an entirely new cost structure develop as automation becomes more and more widespread. Um, I think brands, uh, especially the big CPG brands, really need to understand how they fit in this new world, right? You know, as, as we know, as many listeners know, you know, many of the larger regional and, and national retailers have been uh, uh, developed very sophisticated private label programs that are the equal to many of the top brands now, right? Uh, while providing a much better margin. Uh, and, and they're becoming more and more sophisticated marketers of those private label brands. So I, I think the big CPG brands really need to understand what their role is in this new world. Um, going beyond that, what I speak to in the paper is new business models built out in truly in the digital world. And, you know, what I'm trying to get to there is that, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to create, it's really hard to create exponential growth and exponential value creation in the physical brick and mortar world, right? Mm. You can only build brick and mortar stores so fast. You know, they're very capital intensive. It takes time. Um, you know, there's no two ways about it. But in the digital world, that growth can happen much, much faster. Mm. And I don't think it's dawned on it. It has to some, but many retailers still haven't really understood what's happening here. But there's an opportunity for traditional retailers to enter into or take advantage of this opportunity to create exponential value creation, like the digital natives, like a Google and Amazon, a Facebook, a Twitter, those types of companies, right? Mm -hmm. And it's all about digital growth. You know, stop and think about a brick and mortar retailer um, you know, that has a million shoppers, if they can get those million shoppers digitally engaged, the ability to then extend that network out into other things to mm. tap other networks and grow that network exponentially, uh, opportunities are massive there. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, you know, uh, you know, we haven't talked yet, we've talked about stores, of course, you know, and brands, but there's also the consumer. I mean, there's, you know, you talk here about you know, mind the gap, the expectation gap. And I'm guessing that's a lot to do with, of course, the consumer expectation of what, what retail experiences yes. around that. Absolutely. So, so what are we talking about to mind the gap here? So th there's a couple things. There's a growing on the business side. You know, again, we live in a world today of exponential growth, right? Of, of tech and innovation and so on. And we're seeing some companies like in Amazon 
very aggressive understanding that concept and aggressively moving up and out along that exponential growth curve. And as they do that, as they begin applying AI technology in more and more areas, uh, machine learning, uh, automation, other things, they're opening up a growing productivity gap with slower moving retailers. And that gap is getting bigger by the day. So that's one of the gaps I speak mm -hmm. to. Um, there's absolutely a gap when you start thinking about consumers and shoppers, right? If retailers aren't able to keep up with consumer expectations around uh, what they expect now from a retailer in terms uh, in the digital world, right? In terms of relevancy, personalization, you know, what's in it for me? Wow. So, uh, so um, you know, you, you talk about preparation, preparing, preparing for this future, right? So, I mean, it seems like at this point, and I know you've spent a lot of time in the past episodes uh, talking about what's coming in the future, the kinds of technologies that are coming in, what retailers have to do. And I think we've also talked about some of the challenges that retailers face in terms of adopting some of these technologies. But, you know, when you talk about you know, these three steps of action that you have to take, you know, what are these steps that we're talking about here? So the, the three steps I outline are, are really, the, the first one is retailers understanding what key technologies, what key capability sy systems they have in place today, and beginning to understand what they need to put in place, not just to be best in class today, but this is a classic case of, you know, what's the old Gretzky saying, you know, skate to where the puck's gonna be, not where it is. Mm -hmm. You know, retail executives need to look out as best they can two, three, four, five years and say, what capabilities am I going to need in the future? And sort of understanding what that gap is between where they are, what they have today, and where they need to be and what they need to have to get there. And that begins to really create a roadmap. That roadmap then feeds into the next step of, of the process, which is really focused around discovery and awareness of new innovation, new technologies. Uh, you know, through CART, uh, you know, we, we're looking at hundreds, if not you know, somewhere around a thousand new technologies coming into the in retail industry each year just a massive inflow of new innovation. Retailers aren't built to keep up with that, right? So it's, it's developing innovation as a process and searching for and becoming aware of new capabilities and how they can relate back to that roadmap. And, and then the third piece, and this is the area that, you know, the more time I spend talking to retailers and the more time I spend thinking about this is I, I, I almost think becoming the most important thing. And it's really the culture change, the leadership change that has to happen in retail. Um, you, you know, I'll never forget, uh, I think it was, um, gosh, close to a year ago, uh, you were with us. We were at a, uh, you know, one of the larger regional retailers around, you know, doing an innovation day with their executive team all day. And I had done a short presentation around, you know, where I see retail going. And I'll, I'll never forget, you know, the CIO coming up to me after that saying, completely agree with everything you've said. We know that's where things are going. We know that's where we have to go. Our challenge is we don't know if we can change fast enough to get there, right? Mm -hmm. It's all about that, that mental attitude, that willingness to change, that ability to, to do things faster, more effectively, and so on. Yeah, and I know, you know, in this paper, you, you've mentioned some of Sterling's quotes here. And, you know, he talks about, you know, the, uh, the need to put yourself in discomfort to yes. innovate and disrupt yourself, you know. And I think, you know, innovation is all about, uh, I mean, some, of, some, of, some innovation is not disruptive, but a lot of innovation is disruptive. Yeah. And if you don't create the innovation yourself, somebody else is going to created might disrupt you, right? Yes. So, so I guess you're talking about that being a part of the culture of a company is the ability to kind of reinvent yourself as needed and be comfortable with that process of reinvention. It, 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 absolutely. It's, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, the CEO, the C-level team, the whole executive team, being able to change how they think about things and open, them, open themselves up to new possibilities, open themselves up to new ways of doing things. 
Now, you, you know, in the past, I know just my personal experience in business years ago, you know, it was always easiest to make the really hard decisions when there was a lot of pressure. Right. Right. And, you know, I think that's very much true today across pretty much any business. You know, if, if, if your business is on the line and you know you can't keep doing what you've already done, it's a lot easier to make that leap to do something totally different because there's at that point really no choice. Um, and I, I think it's that type of attitude that, that executives have to develop today because if they keep doing what they've been doing, they aren't going to be around. Yeah, so I mean, this is again all pointing back to the lean startup principles. You just got to be nimble. Yeah. You've got to be able to uh, adjust uh, and innovate internally within the company. And having that culture change is, is critical. I mean, I know it's it's uh, you know startups uh, live and die by that principle because you know as a startup you have to adjust, pivot, you know, yeah. constantly based on what's happening in the market. And I guess it's just that much harder for in an organization with tens of thousands of people to make that change overnight. Well, yeah, it, 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 admittedly, yeah, it is. You know, if you've got, if you employ tens of thousands of people that are dependent upon you for their livelihoods, you know, you're running a billion, five billion, 10 billion, hundred billion dollar a year business, you don't rock the boat, you know, needlessly or too right. easily, right? Um, and, and yet that's just what has to happen here. Right. And I guess, you know, I remember a quote from Jeff Bezos here. Uh, and I think when somebody asked him, you know, how did you build such a big company? He said, well, you know, you just focus on some things that don't change, you know, some things that are constant, and then you can get really good at it. Uh, you don't have to constantly shift. And then the things that do change, don't worry about it because, you know, uh, and then you get really good at something. And I think, you know, you, we keep talking about this corner store, the ability to connect with the customer and make them feel good about coming back into your store. And to me, it constantly seems that that's like the, the central theme of a supermarket yes. retailer is really to have that deep connection with a shopper uh, and knowing them and treating them well and giving them a great experience. And really everything else, all the technologies that go along with creating that experience it could be a, a build or buy or a partnership conversation yes. based on your size, right? And if you're not a retailer that can afford to build that technology, you find smart people to partner with and help you build that and enable that, yeah. right? Uh, it kind of seems like, you know, and, you know, for a listener, if you're, if you're a five-store chain or a 50-store chain or a 200-store chain or a thousand-store chain, the, the solutions don't have to be the same. They, they're, you know, you focus they're on your core business and let technology, if you've got the budget to innovate internally, build it. If you can't, find smart partners that can help you get there. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, you know, we can look back the last hundred years of, of grocery retail and there's been a lot of changes, but the one thing that has not changed is the customer. Correct. How retail serves that customer changes. The products that customer buys may change over time but the customer doesn't change. Right, right. Well, you know, on that note, I think it's, this is a terrific paper. I, I highly encourage that everybody, if you haven't read it, you can go to the CART website, advancingretail.org and download Gary's Retail 4.0 paper. Uh, it's a terrific read. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm, I managed to get sneak peeks of it before it went live. Uh, but this has been a great conversation, Gary. And, and I know five years are going to pass quickly and you're going to, I'm sure you start, <laughs> start collecting material for retail 5.0. Right. Uh, you know, and uh, in five years, maybe we'll be talking about retail 5.0. And I really wish everybody, uh, you know, read the paper if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a solution provider, you're thinking of a startup or you're a retailer or a brand, because I think there's insights for everybody here to learn from and pick uh and, you know, frankly, if I were uh, an entrepreneur looking to start uh, a startup and I'm looking for ideas, I think this paper is a great place to start it because it, you've already done the hard work of identifying key areas that you think are going to change and somebody to identify that. I, I mean, this is a great resource. So great job, Gary. I think it was fantastic. Well, Congratulations again on the paper. And uh, that pretty much brings us to the end of this episode. It was fun. I mean, I don't know where the time went. It just flew by. Uh, but listen, we appreciate you guys following us. And again, this 
podcast doesn't happen all by itself. Uh, Gary and I just have fun talking here, but really <laughs> Stephanie Doherty and Aswini uh, on our team really put this together and put it out on YouTube and, and on all the podcast channels. So we appreciate them big time. And some of our interns put these logos up uh, and created the background. So uh, big thanks to all of them. Uh, again, uh, keep tuning in. We'll expect to see you back uh, on the next episode. I'm not promising you, but we're going to pro most likely have somebody from the VC community uh, come in as a guest uh, talking about funding in retail and what kind of uh, companies they look to fund. Uh, so if you're an entrepreneur or if you're looking uh, to hear about interesting startups, definitely tune in for the next session. But uh, we'll tune out now. And uh, Gary, any parting words? No, it's been a great conversation. Enjoyed talking with you. Thanks for your comments on the floral paper. And uh, I'm sure we're going to be talking again soon. Yep. All right, guys. Until next time. Join us every Monday and connect with us at The Retail Perch on Instagram and Facebook. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us at theretailperch at birdseye.com.